the internal problem is how do you deal with tragedy and malevolence? And you can say, well, I'm not prepared. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Unsurprising, especially if you were overprotected as a child. It's not a good idea to overprotect your kids because the snakes are going to come into the garden no matter what you do. And so then you, instead of trying to keep the damn snakes away, what you do is you arm your child with something that can help them chop them into pieces and make the world out of them. So that the, the trick for human thriving in the face of suffering and malevolence is strength, not protection. It's a completely different idea. We also know this clinically. We know, for example, that if you treat people with exposure therapy for agoraphobia, which is, roughly speaking, the fear of chaos, I would say, the fear of everything, you don't make them less afraid. You make them braver. It's not the same thing. Because with an agoraphobic, see, what happens to them is, is the fall. They never conceptualize death and suffering. They're naive, right? It, it never enters their, the theater of their imagination, and it's because they're protected from it. But then something happens. This, this often happens to women in their 40s, because they're, they're the people most likely to develop agoraphobia. Something happens. They're, they've been protected from chaos by authority their entire life. So maybe they had an overprotective father, and then they went to an overprotective boyfriend, and then they went to an overprotective husband. And maybe they were willing to be subjugated to all three of those because of the protection, right? So, so that's the bargain. They, they stay weak and dependent, and maybe they have to because that's the only way they can appeal to the person who's hyperprotective, but the price they pay for that is that they're not sufficiently competent. And then something happens in their life, often in their 40s, they develop heart palpitations maybe as a consequence of menopause, their heart starts to beat erratically and they think, oh no, death. It's like, well, who are you going to talk to about that? Right? There's no protection from authority for that. Or maybe their friend gets divorced, or maybe their sister dies, or something like that. It brings up the specter of mortality and maybe the specter of malevolence and mortality, and it brings it up in a way that authority, recourse to authority, cannot solve. And so then they have panic attacks. What happens? They go out, they get afraid, they feel their heart beating, then they get afraid of their heart beating because they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and I'm going to make a fool of myself while I'm doing it and attract a lot of attention. So the two big fears come up, mortality and social judgment. And then they have a panic attack, it's like fight or flight's gone out of control. Very, very unpleasant. Then they start to avoid the places they've had a panic attack. Then they end up not being able to go anywhere. So then Tiamat has come back, right? A huge monster, a little victim. And so what do you do with them? Well, you, there's no saying, no, there's no Tiamat. That's done, right? Their naivety is over. They've had a direct contact with the threat of mortality and social judgment. They've met the terrible mother, and they've met the terrible father. And there's no going back. There's no saying, oh, the world is safe. It's not safe. Not at all. It's not safe. The fact that you think it's safe means that you were living in an unconscious bubble that was sort of provided to you by your culture. It's a gift. And now that's been shattered. And so now what do you do? Well, the answer is you retreat until you're in your house and there's nowhere you can go. You're the ultimate frozen rabbit, right? And your life is hell because you can't function. The alternative is, let's take apart the things you're afraid of. Let's expose you to them, you know, carefully and programmatically. And then you'll learn that you can, you're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility, because, you know, people play a role in their own demise, so to speak. When you had opportunity to go out and explore, or withdraw because you were afraid, you chose to withdraw because you were afraid. So it's not only that you were overprotected often, it's that you were willing to take advantage of the pr fact that you were overprotected, and run back there whenever you had the opportunity. You know, so maybe you're a kid in the playground, right, and you're having some trouble with other kids, and you know in the back of your mind, I should deal, this with, deal with this myself, but you go and tell your mom and get her to intervene. And you know that that's not right. You know that you're breaking the social contract, but it's easier, and so that's what you do. You run off to an authority figure and hide behind the great father, right, roughly speaking. Well, the problem with that is you don't learn how to do it yourself. So then you have to relearn it painfully when you're 40. So then you take people out, you say, well, what are you afraid of? Rank it from 1 to 10. So 10 is, we'll make a list of 10 things you're afraid of. The least, the thing you're least afraid of, we'll call number 10. So we'll start with that. Okay, well, I'm afraid of elevators. Okay, well, let's, let's look at a picture of an elevator. Let's have you imagine 
being in an elevator. Let's go out to an elevator and let you watch the terrible jaws of death open, because that's how you're responding to it symbolically. Right? And you're going to do that at, it, at the, the closest proximity you can manage. You find out you go do that, it works. You're nervous as hell, especially an, from an anticipatory perspective. Shaking. You go out, you stop, you watch it happen, and you actually calm down. You do that ten times and it no longer bothers you. Well, what you've learned that you didn't die. But more importantly than that, you've learned that you could withstand the threat of death. That's what you've learned. And then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. And that's often one of the things that often happens in situations like that. I've seen this multiple times is that if you run someone through an exposure training process like that and, and toughen them up, they'll often start standing up to people around them in a way they never did before because they wouldn't stand up for themselves before because they weren't willing to undermine the protection. See, if you're protecting me, I can't bother you because I can't afford to forsake your protection. So if I'm going to play that game, I'm going to be hi hide behind you, then I can't challenge you. So that's no good because that's sometimes why people, you see this with guys very frequently, they're still deathly afraid of their father's judgment when they're in their 30s or 40s. It's like, well, why? Because well, they still want to believe that there's someone out there that knows. And so they're willing to accept the subjugation because it doesn't force them to challenge the idea that there's someone out there that knows. Because that's the advantage of having your father as a judge, right? Because he knows. Well, what if he doesn't? What if no one knows any better than you? Well, that's a rough thing. You don't, until you realize that, you're not an adult, right? That's really technically the point of realization of adulthood, is that no one actually knows what you should do more than you do. I mean, it's a horrible realization, because what the hell do you know? It's a terrible realization, and people will often pick slavery, permanent slavery, to the spirit of the Great Father, let's say, over that realization, and it's completely understandable. But the problem with it is, is that there's more to you than you think, and so if you continue to hide behind that figure, then you never have a chance to understand that there's more to you than you think, far more to you than you think. Maybe there's enough to you so that you can actually withstand the threat of mortality without collapsing. Maybe even withstand the threat of malevolence without collapsing. Who knows? It's certainly possible. And it's not an abstract question. It's exactly the sort of question that you address in the psychotherapeutic process. It's, it's always the question that you address. And the answer is often in the affirmative. Because people can get unbelievably tough. And you know that, because people work in emergency wards and hospitals, right? Or they work in in uh, palliative care wards, or they work as mortuary assistants. I mean, these people have bloody rough jobs. You know, or they're on the front line of police investigation into, you know, heinous child abuse crimes, and so they're confronting malevolence on a regular basis. And, you know, those are very stressful jobs, but people do them. And, and some people do them without even being damaged by them. Although that's a harder thing, because you can see horrible things, you know, things you'll never forget.